You're just in time. Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, Bill Harlan from ERI is here. We're going to see a lot of great pictures and even some drone footage of antennas in action and under test and get to learn a little bit about how FM antennas work and what's important when selecting one. It's all coming up next on Twert. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By Angry Audio. Audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. By Nautel, keeping you connected with your community with support and webinars. Online at nautel.com slash webinars. And by MaxConnect Wireless, prioritized high-speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from the uh, light bulb to the, uh, the microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. And this week, we're going to talk about stuff that is really close to that light bulb at the top of the tower. You'll see what I mean in just a minute, because Bill Harland of ERI is our guest. We're going to be talking about FM antennas, the technology behind uh, getting the most FM signal out to your listeners. And it is fascinating because there's so many sciences that go into the design, uh, creation, fabrication, and installation and utilization of FM antennas. I can't wait. Hi, I'm Kirk Harnack. I'm in the uh, Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee. Got lots of Telos Alliance gear all around me and really appreciate uh, my friends at Telos saying, hey, you can have an hour off on Thursdays and do this week in radio tech. And that's just a real blessing. So glad to have that done. Enough about me. Let's check in with my co-host, the ever popular, patriotic, awesome dude known as Chris Tobin. Hey, Chris, welcome in. Hello, Kirk. Thank you very much. I I know we're talking antennas. Uh, uh, behind me is an FM combiner system from another company, but uh, I figured, what the heck, it would be fun sitting in front of uh, FM combiners while we're talking about FM antenna technology. And uh, let's see, you're you're in well, one of your secret locations that you often come to us from, right? Yes, this is a uh, Shively combiner behind me. Yeah, balanced yeah. hybrid combiner. I make sure that I read the label correctly. Yes, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I know Just somebody will yell. I'll get a call from what's his name. I, one of the guys at Chively going, well, you, you, you said it wrong. <laughs> well, you hang out. The, you seem to hang out there a lot. Is, is there like a coffee bar up there? What What's the attraction? Oh, it's lots of bent metal, right? <laughs> lots of bent metal, as you can see. There's an angle here. There's an angle there. There's an angle here. There's a lot of angles in this room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear you. All right. Well, uh, and... Tell you what, um, let's go ahead and introduce our guest, although we do have an announcement to make uh, from Nautel coming up in just a second. I want to not delay at all and bring in Bill Harlan. A lot of you know Bill. You've talked to him on the phone. You've gotten proposals from him. Not the marriage kind, but the uh, the antenna kind. Bill, welcome into the show. I'm so delighted you're here. Oh, and I'm so glad to be here. Um, Yeah, this has been uh, really great. We haven't been on the show in a long time. We we did uh, a little interview, I think, at a at a NAB uh, convention where you explained a few things. Uh, we're going to do some big explanations. We got lots of pictures to share, and even some drone mm-hmm. video of some ERI FM antennas. And I can't wait. I've got I've got a whole page of of questions from our pre show discussion that we're going to be talking about this week. In Radio Tech is brought to you in part by our friends at Nautel and Chris and I. As usual, we have a pronouncement for you about Nautel and their transmission talk Tuesdays. They're roundtable discussions. They're not webinars. They're roundtable discussions. And that means you get to participate um, with these discussions. The topics coming up in October, they're continuing these through October now. Uh, Topics coming up, winterizing, HD costs, uh, cloud-based everything. And I don't know if I can read this. Stuff that went boom. (laughs) And if, you, and if you know Jeff Welton, he says he uses the word boom a lot. That went boom. This went boom. That's all coming up. You can register to jump into this roundtable discussion this coming Tuesday, but you can register right now at nautel.com slash webinars for transmission talk Tuesday, nautel.com slash webinars. Now, this coming Tuesday, the discussion is going to center around war stories. <laughs> We've done war stories here on our show, and uh, it's a favorite of Chris's and mine to do these war stories. Uh, but the discussions this Tuesday is going to center around the worst we've ever seen. So 
uh, and things that can be done to make the best of bad situations. Um, I, I can't wait for Jeff Welton to talk about this along with a lot of you and a lot of me and from the audience participating. What can be done to reduce the chance of issues arising from poor or let's say suboptimal installations? Things we can do to decrease the risk of failure without burning it all down and starting from scratch. Uh, Jeff Welton would love to hear from you on this topic and is going to open the floor to your input and questions. And if I can possibly be there, I will. I've, I've made most of them, at least for, for a few minutes. And uh, I'm eager to hear other people's war stories, uh, you know, the worst you've ever seen <laughs> coming up this Transmission Talk Tuesday. So go register. Uh, you can open a browser window right now and go register at Nautel, N-A-U-T-E-L, Nautel.com slash webinars. And you'll get an invite to come on into the webinar, you get the link. And um, I shouldn't call it a webinar, it's a round table discussion. Thanks a lot to Nautel for uh, letting us talk about your Transmission Talk Tuesday. All right, Chris and Bill. Um, Bill, I, I almost don't know where to start because this topic of FM antennas to me is absolutely fascinating. It's, it's a lot of black magic in some ways. And yet I do know enough about what's going on to, you know, be able to, let's say cogitate on and understand a lot of what you're about to tell us but i kind of need it all put together like i got most of the puzzle pieces but they're not all assembled into the final puzzle so um bill maybe you can start out by um telling us a little bit about eri and you know the early days of eri in the 1940s and uh, how you guys got to chandler indiana where you are now what's the story of eri well, the company was founded in uh, 1943. Uh, uh, Tom Silliman, our CEO and owner's dad, uh, Robert Silliman, was a, a broadcast consultant uh, throughout the 50s. But during World War II, he worked for Andy Alford at the uh, Radio Research Lab at Harvard. And uh, they were doing research in, thing, in radar, uh, instrument landing systems, radio location systems, and uh, one of the big things they worked on was uh, chafe to a uh, jam radar. And the problem with having the radio uh, research lab at Harvard is you were right next to uh, Boston Harbor. And so the German submarines would come in and keep an eye on what kind of field work the radio research lab was doing. And uh, so one of the guys who worked at the radio research lab was from Evansville, Indiana. And he suggested that he move back to Evansville and open a company. And he did. And that's electronics research. And so for the balance of the war, they did all of their research here because you can't get a German submarine to go up the Ohio River. <laughs> and then after the war was over, uh, uh, Tom Silliman or Robert Silliman returned to his uh, practice in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, he worked with electronics research to uh, develop the uh, 37 ring antenna for Collins Radio for uh, their new FM antenna business or FM transmitter business. And uh, he got the design done and passed that over to ERI, and they were manufacturing it for Collins. And uh, then a few years after that, uh, Collins called uh, Robert Silliman one day and asked him to come to Evansville and find out why the antennas they were working or they were getting from uh, ERI were no longer working. Mm. And uh, when he got here, what he found was that the uh, founder and the technical uh, 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 resource behind the company had passed away and the accountant and the widow were trying to run the company. And so, uh, Robert Silliman bought, uh, 50% of the company in one share and, uh, the other, uh, portion of the company went to two key employees and, uh, ERI reopened and primarily focused on the FM antenna business. And, uh, since then, uh, we expanded. Uh, we were down by the airport in Evansville, and then we moved into downtown Newburgh. And in 1992, we moved to the 100-acre campus we're on today. And uh, in 2003, we acquired Andrews Broadcast Equipment Business and moved that down here. And so we're doing not only FM antennas, but transmission line, filters, and uh, television antennas all on this campus. Wow. That, that is a lot. And uh, what, what, what a way to grow. Um, so... Uh, we've got a lot of pictures to share and the pictures will bring up, you know, the things that we want to talk about. So a lot of this show is going to be looking at, at pictures of antennas and, and, and test procedures and things like that. Uh, so that there'll be, you know, natural things to, uh, to, to talk about. Yeah, Bill. No, I'm just saying, yes, I'm ready. Okay. And you know, a lot of people, 
you know, people uh, my age or maybe a bit younger, most of what we know about ERI is the famous rototiller design. And we're certainly going to be looking at some of those and talking about how that works. But Bill, uh, before we jump into the, some of the pictures, uh, I found out from you today, and I, I should have known this, is I've bought other antennas from ERI, but you guys make plenty of other FM designs other than the famous rototiller. Um, so what, just cover the couple or three models, uh, you know, model series aside from the rototiller design. Well, the rototiller, of course, it, we have a low and a medium power version of the rototiller, and uh, they're used for single channel applications for the most part. But we also have special versions uh, which can operate with two, three or more FM channels and a single antenna. Uh, mm -hmm. the, we have a version of the rototiller, which we call the Axiom, which is an actual true master FM antenna that's a side mount antenna. And, of course, we have our 1180 and 1190 series panel antennas. Uh, which are used for either single or multi-station antennas, either directional or non-directional. Uh, the 1080 and 1180 series uh, is probably best known because there are three of them on the Empire State Building. Mm. Uh, the 100A is a low-power translator antenna that we've produced for about 10 years. And uh, the 1105 is uh, a sl an improved version of what used to be the cycloid and dual cycloid uh ring stub antenna that really was the first circular polarized antenna uh, that ERI manufactured. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I, I like learning about FM antennas from that ring stub design because that it's almost easy to visualize what's going on there, but we might get some uh, input from you. Let's go ahead and, and suncast. If, if we could start with the pictures, um, it, reverse. Oh, here we go. Great. Bill, take it away. Tell us what are we looking at right here? Well, this particular antenna, this is uh, the University of South Florida's FM station and uh, FM train antenna in uh, Riverview, Florida. Uh, that's on a thousand foot tower we put up uh, whoa, two years before the repack started. So I think it was 2014 or 2015. The eight bays on top with a lambda section. It's, as you can see, it tapers from the uh, 57 inch base tower. Uh, that little platform you see on the side there is a transition platform to get out from the inside ladder to the outside ladder to get to the oh. antenna. And the uh, tower to the right is uh, the uh, uh, what they call the PBS tower. It's got uh, WEDU TV on top and uh, w, what used to be WUSF TV uh, on the bottom. That was their digital antenna, the air tower and antennas that they built uh, as part of the transition. And uh, WUSF was uh, one of those stations that was uh, purchased by the FCC during the uh, repack auction. And so the spectrum could be repurposed. And they're in a channel sharing arrangement with uh, WEDU now on RF channel 13. So this, th this antenna in the middle of the picture here, that 8-bay, uh, that's, that's the rototiller. Is, is that the high-power version of that? It's a high-power, full-wave-spaced full rototiller. For, uh, it's a Class Z 0 FM WUSF. Being full space, those are approximately 10 feet apart. Is that right? Uh, right yeah, at, uh, they're at a non-commercial frequency, so yeah. uh, below 90 megahertz. So they're on the order of uh, 130 inches apart. Okay. Okay. 11 feet or so. All right. Now we're going to, uh, not right now, but a little bit later on, we're going to talk about that Lambda section. You use that word Lambda. And uh, I'd like to make sure I have a, a good understanding of what that means. So let's, uh, uh, Suncast, if we could go ahead and look at, at the next picture here, we're going to buzz through about three of these pretty quickly. Oh my goodness. What are we looking at here, Bill? Well, that's, this tower is actually just a few miles south of the, uh, or the, the Riverview uh, site. This is uh, owned by Beasley in uh, Tampa. It's uh, down by the water. Uh, the antenna on top's uh, WPBB. It's a half wave spaced uh, eight bay on a lambda. And if you look closely there, you can see near the top, the lambda is actually oriented independently of the base tower. Wow. And so, yeah. yeah, so that's freestanding on top. And then below that is a, a directional uh, LP series uh, rototiller. Uh, for uh, a translator that's uh, rebroadcasting an HD2 signal for uh, Beasley's WYUU. So I've never seen uh, a that like a top tower section. I've seen lambda section. I've never seen one that was of a different orientation than the main tower. Why was that done here? Because the uh, the the best pattern uh, for the coverage area they wanted. 
Uh, that's in a, a wetland area where they've only got limited places where they can put the guy anchors for the base tower. Hmm. And so what they needed to do to give, give them the face mounting they wanted on that Lambda was they needed to orient the Lambda section in a completely different direction. So that means two things. You need an index plate and it needs to be freestanding. Now, it's maybe freestanding, but it's not what you might call freewheeling. They, they can't turn that no. at will, right? <laughs> okay. No, they can't turn it at will. And it's very important that we put the holes in the right place when we build it. I, <laughs> I guess so. Well, t now, t tell me, t tell you what, um, uh, right now may be a good time uh, before our first, uh, our first commercial break here. Tell me about the Lambda section. What's key, key about that? I always thought a Lambda section was typically smaller and but that lambda section looked pretty pretty big pretty big fat face on it what's a lambda section yeah. all about a lambda is this is a something eri developed back in uh the late 80s early 90s uh the the problem with putting an fm antenna on a standard tower section standard tower sections are going to be 20 or 30 feet long and what happens is because the beta bay spacing on an fm antenna varies with frequency and it's 10 feet at 98 megahertz it's a different beta bay spacing uh at every other frequency so if you just put that on a standard 20 foot section then the cross bracing the diagonals the horizontal girts behind each bay of the antenna are different and they're going to impact the horizontal and vertical plane pattern differently so what the lambda is is the lambda is a it's a proprietary, trademarked, uh, optimized FM mounting system, which is built in half wave increments based on the bay to bay spacing of the FM antenna it supports. And that means that every bay sees the same structural geometry behind it huh. all the way up and down the tower. And what that means is if I take a two bay rototeller and I model it. And when we do these range measurements, we actually range measure them on a section of the Lambda we are building to hold that antenna. We put that on the range. We measure two bays of a 12 bay array. Then we know that when we stack all 12 of those bays, they will all act the same way as the two we measured. Wow. Wow. Okay. Okay. I, I, I was under the mistaken impression that a Lambda section was more or less invisible to the RF. It's not invisible. It's predictable. You know how it reacts with the antenna that's mounted on it, right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. And All that, the in, other thing... Invisible would be kind of cool. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Invisible would be great. But the problem with invisible is you do that with fiberglass. And the problem is you do need a path to ground or something will blow up. Yeah. Uh, the other thing with an Lambda is... When antennas break, it is usually because the tower that's supporting it is not stiff enough. So when we design the Lambda, it's got a 3,000 foot radius of curvature for the antenna it's supporting. So it's a very rigid structure and that protects the antenna over its lifespan. So you're saying that one reason antennas break is because the, the towers holding them can wiggle in the wind and so forth, and that flexes all the joints on the, uh, on the antenna. Yes, and uh, it's even more critical in a pole. I have seen that happen. I've seen antennas fail that way, and uh, I've thought it was maybe perhaps of poor mounting practice, but it, they may be mounted properly and still break because they're yeah. not mounted to a rigid, a rigid enough piece of tower. Wow. Yes. Wow. Yes. So you should ask yeah. about the radius and curvature of your structure. Wow. All right, Bill. Uh, we're with Bill Harlan from ERI. Well, a lot more to go, a lot more pictures and some video, some drone video coming up. Uh, Chris Tobin, I'm finding this absolutely fascinating because I don't get a chance to, to ask these kind of questions ever. Uh, and, and Chris, of course, I, I need to make sure you're, you feel welcome to jump right in and, and ask a question if we're not uh, answering what, what you want to hear. What do you think so far, Chris? Oh, I, I think it's perfect. It's great. It's some of the things I've read about and learned and talked to folks over the years, but I have to say, my personal experience with ERI antennas over my 30 plus year career has been very predictable. Um, the one thing I always tell people when working on broadcast equipment is, you know, reliability, predictability, and, you know, longevity. And that's the one thing I can say about the ERI antennas I've ex been exposed to. And uh, it's, it's unbelievable. I, I have to find a way to make time to come down to the plant, of course, through invitation, and just get a chance to really look at how this stuff goes. Because 
Antenna design, I do a lot of land mobile radio stuff, microwave linking, and we do some wacky antenna positioning and, and propagation concepts and break the rules a lot. But to be able to design predictably and every time is just, that, that is an art in itself. And I really applaud what you guys do. Well, I, th I think we're going to learn a lot more uh, coming up here as we move on through. And remember, ERI makes you know TV antennas too, and just oh, it's amazing what they do. We got pictures of the range that Bill Harlan mentioned. That'll be coming up a bit later in the show. It's uh, episode five eleven of this week in Radio Tech with Kirk and Chris and Bill Harlan from ERI. We're brought to you in part uh, by our friends at Angry Audio. Uh, they are, fr even though they're angry, they're friends. And this is their famous, I mean, people are loving this. I'm hearing more and more people are using this, especially for broadcasting from home. It is the Bluetooth audio gadget from Angry Audio. You know what? This thing costs a lot less than you might anticipate. You know, uh, uh, custom made uh, or designed for broadcast gear sometimes is, is kind of spendy. Well, not the Bluetooth audio gadget. Check it out. You pair it with your phone and it automatically, depending on what the phone wants to do, it automatically decides, am I going to do a two-way conversation and use one audio profile or am I going to use a one-way audio path uh, from your from your audio source uh, plugged into the Bluetooth audio gadget to the phone, like for example, for sending audio, or am I gonna receive audio from the phone via Bluetooth and put that, let's say, send it to the audio console. Either way, this unit decides what you're doing and gives you the best audio for each application. It does that automatically. That's part of, of Bluetooth, but it's gotta be properly implemented in order to work right. Well, the, the Bluetooth audio gadget is truly professional. On the back, you're gonna find an analog audio input, left and right analog outputs, and you'll find a digital output as well. That's AES3, AES-EBU. Uh, so that is uh, just, it just works amazingly well. I have talked to people who say, hey, I needed a, a phone hybrid and I didn't have a phone line. All I had was my cell phone, and yet I want to do high quality, or as best as I can, quality uh, audio from callers. And the Bluetooth audio gadget will absolutely get that done for you. Moreover, let's say you've got some songs on your on your phone that you've recorded. Maybe you've got a file you downloaded. You just need to get that audio played from your phone into your audio console. You can do it with this right here. Hey, you know what? I'm just putting this out there. You could have... You could have an emergency studio transmitter link using the Bluetooth audio gadget. Plug the output of this into your FM processor at your transmitter site. Use your phone. Okay, you better plug it into a power supply. Use your phone to pick up your station stream and put it into here and get your station back on the air if all else fails. How about that? An emergency STL, the Bluetooth audio gadget. And, you know, in the past, maybe you've had trouble with Bluetooth. That's, that's kind of a thing of the past. This uses the latest Bluetooth technology to pair with the latest Bluetooth standards in your phone to give you really good audio quality. Um, again, I've talked to a number of people who say they love it. Well, you can get the Bluetooth audio gadget from your favorite uh, equipment dealer. Just make sure that they carry Angry Audio stuff. And if you want to find out more about it, go to the Angry Audio website at angryaudio.com. I really appreciate Angry Audio for sponsoring the show. And you're going to appreciate all the cool stuff you'll find there, including Studio Hub. Studio Hub gear is all available at the angryaudio.com website. Thanks a lot for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. And hey, engineers, I really appreciate if you uh, will patronize our, our advertisers and let them know that you heard about it right here. It really does help us out. All right, we're talking to Bill Harlan. Uh, I'm Kirk Harnack along with Chris Tobin. And Bill, I guess, why don't we jump right back into photos, if, if, you, if you don't mind. Um, uh, Suncast, I know I'm asking you to spin the dials pretty quickly, but oh, well, here we go. What are we looking at here, Bill? Another rototiller. Yes, this is a low power rototiller uh, for uh, it's a four bay end fed, uh, and uh, that's also on a lambda mounting section. That's at the top of a four hundred foot self supporting tower we built for uh, Sarkis Tarzian in Fort Wayne. Uh, put that uh, this tower up, I believe, in about two thousand four uh, at uh, a new location uh, for uh, their cluster there. Uh, okay. You can see the anti rotation brackets there. Yeah, I, was gonna, I, got, I got several questions. Okay, so the extra horizontal poles that go from the leftmost leg on the picture to the mounting bracket, those are anti-rotation? Is that what you called them? They're anti-rotation brackets because the leg we're, that's supporting the antenna is uh, less than two inches in diameter. So mm. there's not enough area there for the bracket to grab to make sure it doesn't spin. Okay, okay. Now, is, does that one look uh, half or full wave spaced or something else? It's full wave spaced. 
Okay. All right. From the saying, you know, from the ground, it's a little hard to tell sometimes. And this one is yep. end end fed. Uh, yes. What is uh, wh when do you decide if an antenna is going to be end fed or center fed? Oh, that's uh, that's a really good question and a really easy question. Um, an end fed antenna. The more the more bays you add to the end of the array, the more difficult it is to get to tune. So mm -hmm. generally, we try and limit end fed arrays to five bays or less. Beyond okay. that, we center feed. Uh, also, in an FM antenna, unlike a TV antenna where you've got slots up and down uh, an outer conductor, and you can you can move the slots up and down the outer conductor as you wish and couple them independently. An FM antenna is just a is series fed and generally has even amounts of power applied to each bay and mm -hmm. in a center fed array if you want to add beam tilt or null fill doing that in an end fed array is is difficult it's easy to do in a center fed array because you either in the case of null fill you change the power division so it's not even half up half down you put more power in the lower half of the antenna and in the case of beam tilt you move the uh, the center feed up or down to tilt the beam as you wish uh, it's a very simple and expensive way to do it and that's because because with a tv antenna when you're charging two hundred thousand dollars for a top mounted antenna you can spend a little more time on the the little details of that versus what we should sell an fm antenna for if i could ask suncast to show us that same picture again i've got one more question the same picture we were looking at <clears throat> and that is about the little star-shaped objects at the very top tell me what we're looking at there uh, those are uh, ERI lightning spurs. Uh, they're, that's a feature that's included with every one of our antennas and also with our top mounted TV antennas. It's a galvanized steel rod and then at the top you've got a, a set of bent stainless steel pieces which create a kind of a, f a metal flower, if you will, uh, that uh, dissipates energy. Uh, the idea behind a lightning rod is you're supposed to be dissipating any static buildup into the atmosphere. It's not it's not there to try and get lightning to strike it. Uh, the benefit of the little flowers there is one, it gives you multiple points, and two, over time as uh, they get eaten with static, uh, you can replace them without having to replace the whole rod. Ah, okay, okay, got gotcha. you. Occasionally, I, I fly a drone and I get some really good pictures of those. So thanks a lot. Uh, if we could look at the uh, the next picture here pretty quickly, we'll uh, we'll see what's uh, what's next. Oh, this is the range pictures. Okay, talk to me about uh, about the range and how you make oh. that work. All right, this is a fifty acre test range we've got. It's about five miles from the the main plant, uh, and this is one of two turntables we have out at that facility. You know, on this particular facility, the, the equipment shack is actually the basement underneath that uh, turntable. Uh, this particular, this is a two bay half wave spaced LPX. And uh, they're in the first stages of d developing that as a directional FM antenna. Uh, the source, the in, in our test range, the antenna under test is the source antenna. And you see there on the right, that's the uh, a monopole that we've got mounted there. And it's got two uh, basket receive antennas, one horizontally polarized and one vertically polarized. And that actually measures the signal as, as the uh, antenna is rotated on that platform below. Okay, so let me get this straight. So uh, we, I can I just noticed in the picture, I started looking for it when you mentioned it. Over in the far right, upper right-hand corner, there is a monopole uh, at the end of that mowed grass area. So mm -hmm. I'm sorry, is, is that one receiving or transmitting? That's receiving, and that's got data cables that come back to the the uh, the equipment shed, which is the basement of that uh, structure, and uh, that records what the measured pattern is. So how would you choose in your test range if you're – antenna under test is actually transmitting or is actually receiving because you could do it either way couldn't you you can do it either way and the results are the same that just happens to be how we set the range up okay okay i and i it's so um <clears throat> it's so cool that well I, I, I when you turn that thing does it turn 360 degrees or more than 360 does it spin continuously and if so how would you couple the power to it or you know what what's the arrangement of, of the the bottom there where you're coupling the antenna into the equipment that's measuring oh uh, we actually it turns around and then turns back so so you're turning 360 degrees and then turning back and is it just yeah. cables flexing underneath or is there some cool yeah, contraption? It's just, 
it's just a cable flexing underneath. There's nothing okay. really magic about it. The positioner itself is actually the real magic. The positioner. So I guess you've got to know precisely how it's positioned, don't yeah. you? Yes, and you've wow. got to get that back. And today we don't we don't write any of this stuff down. In the old days, they used to move the turntable by hand and write it down every two degrees. Right. Okay. And that, that next question: How every how many degrees is uh, is acceptable for measurement, or or what do you guys do we better than acceptable? Uh, we generally just measure each degree. Each degree. Okay. Let's take a look at at the next picture. I think we had a couple of uh, of range pictures here. I'm not. Not sure. Let's see what Suncast pops up next. Oh yeah, now this is a, a different site. Uh, this is just the uh, the other turntable we have out at that site. Uh, oh. Again, this is a, a two uh, two bay uh, rototiller under test. Uh, this is uh, we've had both these turntables out here for quite some time, but this particular one with the uh, the building behind it is actually we spent a lot of time making sure there wasn't any metal in that building, um, and. Uh, there are, it is no plumbing and piping. You've got to walk over to the machine shed if you have a need. Uh, and uh, that's uh, uh, the largest of our two turntables. We can uh, we can actually put a 10-foot face tower on the top of that and, and spin it or a 12-foot. Uh, so uh, it's it's a pretty substantial piece of equipment. Now, the antenna, the, the tower section we're looking at there, is that a lambda section? Is that that particular one or is it just an ordinary tower section? It's just a regular tower section. We have a whole bone yard, which you can probably see over there in the upper left-hand corner. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, we can pretty well put together any kind of model that's required. Again, as I said earlier, if, if it's a Lambda section, we actually do the testing on the Lambda that will hold the antenna. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do, do we, what's the next picture we have here, Suncast? Ah, and a drone view of, of the facility. What are we looking at here? Yeah, uh, this is a, we do have a separate machine shop out there, and uh, there are some equipment sheds. And uh, just wanted to show some of the different, uh, the large number of structures we have laying around to uh, to turn into whatever we need them to be. Gotcha. Um, in, in 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 talking about pattern testing an antenna, uh, yeah, in in many cases. It's absolutely required. Like if you have a directional antenna, right? You you have to have this pattern. If you um, have a full service facility, yes. And if you are using the directional antenna to pr to protect in another FM station, you have to use either full scale or uh, fractional scale models on a a accurate representation of the structure, and have that as a proof of performance to get your license. If you're a, a secondary facility like an FM translator or an LPFM, uh, assuming LPFMs get allowed to go directional, uh, you are allowed to just use a computer model because as a secondary service, if you cause interference, you've got to turn off the air. Ah, okay. So um, I've been in situations several times where I'm I'm working for a a um, relatively uh, small, low budget station. Uh, the the pattern of the antenna is not extremely critical. In, a, uh, in other words, we're not trying to we're not tr trying to make sure we get as much power somewhere or try to get maximum uh, circularity in, in the pattern. What, in your mind, uh, what's what's a tipping point between no pattern, no range testing, and 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 range testing? It's really a revenue-driven requirement. I mean, if 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 the results are critical and you are talking about uh, six digit monthly revenues, then it's probably well worth the investment. And while fractional scale modeling is perfectly legal and perfectly acceptable to the commission, the problem is if you're going to do things at third or quarter scale, when you're talking about scaling something up like uh or scaling something down like a 10-foot face tower structure into an accurate model one-fourth the size and the same going for the radiating elements you're using it's very difficult to replicate that precisely at the smaller scale and then if you're adding parasitics and directors or uh, uh, changing bracket angles, scaling that back up and creating an accurate 
recreation of that at full scale. And it's a very difficult thing to do. When you do things at full scale, it's much easier to know what you're measuring and then make it again, make it accurately to ship to the field. Gotcha. Gotcha. Hey, let's buzz through a few more pictures before we have to take our, our next break. Suncast, let's take a look at this next one and have Bill tell us about this particular installation. What are we looking at here? Oh, that one's not too far from you. That's in Crawfordsville, Arkansas. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the center tower of a three-tower AM array. Uh, it's a DA2 uh, that's uh, AM990. Uh, so that's in a wetland area. The platform there at the bottom is a 25-foot tall platform we built. Then on top of that is a series fed AM radiator uh, that's a 181 degree tower for the 990. And uh, iHeart has uh, an FM antenna at the very top of that tower uh, for uh, KIYS. Uh, so uh, that's a 1019, or I'm sorry, it's a KWNW now, uh, KISS FM. And uh, that's. Uh, uh, at the base there, it's a series fed antenna, so there's also a, an ERI isocoupler at the base of the tower. Yeah, we have some close-ups of the isocoupler. Let's switch to, to the next uh, picture and, and have a look at that uh, that isocoupler. Wow. Yeah, that's a model <laughs> it's, it's 425. All <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, quite the manly structure. Uh, it's... Uh, You've got a, the I-beam base there of the tower, and it's sitting on the base insulator, and uh, uh, then the 425 is on a post that's uh, on the platform. So for those unfamiliar, the isocoupler, that big can that's horizontal, uh, the, the, well, you, you do a better job. Tell us what that does. Why is it necessary in this installation? All right. You've got a series fed AM tower, and this is part of a directional array. It's a DA2. The center, this taller center tower is used both day and night. And you've got that whole hunk of steel sitting on an insulator because that's the driven part of the antenna. And then the ground system is the, the ground plane. And so you, if you were to just run that piece of coax with the FM uh, signal on it across that base insulator, you would in essence be, gr you would be grounding this hot AM tower. And so what's inside that uh, big barrel there is a, a pair of tuned uh, uh, elements that actually couple the power for the FM across the base insulator and leave an air gap. So there's a hot side and a cold side. So there's actually a, a fiberglass insulator on the uh, right-hand side of that. So the whole, that part of the uh, transmission line run is at the same potential as the AM tower. And then we can switch to the next, the uh, we switch to the next picture, but before we do, <clears throat> oh, okay. Well, there's a, an, I saw the Austin ring uh, transformer uh, there also, which was, which is awfully cool. Uh, so Suncast, go to whichever. There you go. The the X kind of an X like looking thing at the left hand side of the base of the mm -hmm. tower is looks like Austin Ring transformer. So that gets uh, AC power for the tower lights across that base insulator, and uh, that's it's one ring inside the other. You know, a, a good puzzle at, at Cracker Barrel is how to get these rings apart, <laughs> and and it's a transformer. It's an AC power transformer. So that whole that whole tower on top of the insulator is indeed insulated from anything below it. Uh, of course, it's fed with the hot uh, AM power as part of the directional array. But I just thought that that Austin ring there was uh, was pretty cool. You don't see those terribly often anymore. But the next picture, we get a better view of your ISO coupler. And uh, you said part of that was actually insulated. Where's the insulator at exactly? It's actually, if you see that elbow, the elbow uh, on the right-hand side there is actually bolted right to there. There's uh, that whole face there is fiberglass and there's ah, something okay. inside there. There are a pair of, uh, we also have a pair of rings in there that uh, uh, create an air gap, but they are tuned to pass the FM power uh, across that uh, insulator. So, so all the power or almost all the power of the FM station that goes through there, uh, it indeed goes through. There's very little loss in this situation. About how much loss would there be through an isocoupler? Oh, uh, le less than 0 0.05 dB. It's, 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 they're, they're not a big loss thing. The, bi the, the biggest thing with isolation transformers uh, is leakage. And so you've got to be 
it's a good idea to, it's something that you should sweep every once in a while because a lot of these, you'll see the big box type FM isolation transformers where basically they've used some kind of insulator to make one half of the box hot and the other half of the box is cold. Those are outside. Uh, they generally, if, if they're not pressurized, they can leak. And you start leaking not only air, you start leaking RF. So we, we, we end up selling a lot of FM isolation transformers simply because they find high RFR levels. Ah, okay. All right. Hey, uh, coming up, you're watching This Week in Radio Tech with Bill Harlan, Kirk Harnack, and Chris Tobin is along. He's up in a bunch of RF himself. Uh, Chris, I'm finding this just fascinating. And, you know, I, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I think only one of my radio stations that I have actually has an isocoupler. It's for um, it's for a low power FM translator to cross a, a hot AM insulator. I haven't seen one of those high power uh, isocouplers in a long time. Do, do you run across those, Chris, in any of your stations? Uh, my stations, no. I mean, I haven't done AMs in a couple of years, but throughout my career, I did AM FM combos, and we had high power, low power, and, and the uh, barrel type canister. ERI isocouplers I have used on many occasions on my ERI antennas on an AM tower. Uh, and we also had the Austin rings. So, yeah, it was always fun explaining to people what that's all about. Uh, and, yeah, it, I, it's great because everything Bill's talking about is stuff that I cannot fathom why some people just don't find it fascinating. It's just, you know, I know there's very few books on it nowadays. I do have some old NAB handbooks that are written in 1950s that do reference a few of the things that Bill has talked about. And they even show pictures of turntables for antennas in general. But uh, it's a fascinating part of our industry that I think is really a, a lost art. I mean, I, there are a couple of guys that come here to this site. Uh, for, this is an FM site that's got backup state stations. I'm primary with two others that are primary, but this is a backup site for the others here in New York. And the guys that come up, there's a few of them that have been here for a long time in the market. And when we get talking and some of the stuff we talk about, it's like it's foreign to the young kids. I'll call it that, the young ones. They're to the point where they panic. They, they look on their face like, what? You could do what with that? How much power? It's like, yeah. Meanwhile, the two or three of us are going, yeah, we've done it all the time. And yeah, yeah, you get a few sparks. Watch out for that. But you'll be okay. No. Chris, uh, until coming you've up. you've experienced it. Yeah. You know, until you've experienced it, it's amazing. <laughs> coming up, Chris, after this break, uh, we're going to be looking at an antenna that is on the Empire State Building. Now, we're not going to look at it on ESB, but we're going to look at it at ERI. So that is coming up. Bill has provided some very cool pictures, and I can't wait to get an explanation of exactly uh, what it is and how it works. And, Chris, I think you're going to recognize it because you've seen it many times. It's This Week in Radio oh, Tech, yeah. Episode 511 with Kirk Harnack and Chris Tobin. Our guest is Bill Harlan from ERI. Uh, by the way, there's a lot of educational uh, papers and stuff at ERI. It's uh, ERI, Inc., ERI, I-N-C. Dot com is, is the website. A lot of resources there. We'll put those in the show notes. Hey, our show is brought to you in part by Broadcasters General Store, and BGS is your place to get anything you want, but one of the great things you can get, because it's a great little field utility mixer, if you just need what it does, it does it really well, and that is the Broadcast Tools Pro Mix 4. The Pro Mix 4, hey, I told you it, it, it'll solve your problem if, if this was what you need. It's a mono mixer. It's a four-channel mono mixer with a USB interface. And that means it can be perfect for your COVID social distancing studio at home. Let's say that you've got a couple people at home uh, that need to be on the air. You get socially distanced in the house, or maybe you're in the same family, husband and wife team, and you get on the microphone inputs there, you connect the USB connection to your computer, and you send your mixed audio to the studio. And the studio sends you a mix minus back of all the things that aren't you. It's a perfect, perfect solution for the home studio. Even if you're by yourself, uh, it lets you insert um, audio from your computer so you can play out audio from the computer and put that on the air. Uh, it's just a really cool little full-featured little audio mixing console. Um, it has features like three universal mic or monaural line input level ch uh, input channels. It has a one mono balance line level uh, input as well. Plus, it has a balanced mono program output with a defeatable soft clipper. So, hey, if you get excited and yell, make sure that soft clipper's in. That way you won't clip the audio going to whatever you're feeding. It's got a built-in USB connection for computer audio playback and recording. It has a mix minus output if you need that. It has an LED audio uh, output level VU meter. 
that's important because, you know, we can get pretty loud and, and uh, forget about watching our levels. Well, that meter really stands out. Full duplex talkback capability and an IFB audio input with level adjustment. Plus, built in, it's got those quarter-inch stereo headphone outputs with independent volume, IFB pan, and program pan controls for a custom headphone mixes uh, for, uh, for your talent and for yourself. That can, you know, you don't have to have a separate little box doing your headphone amplification. Uh, actually, this box is, is what we need, what Twert needs on the road. Um, uh, it, plus, it has an uh, air, on, on, on air tally warning light relay output. And that's something that you won't find on, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, guitar store uh, mixing consoles. So, this is really a professional little console. And I would encourage you to check it out. It's great for remotes. It's great to have one at the transmitter site if you have to go on from there. And as I mentioned, it's great for our broadcasting from home uh, period of time that we're in right now. And who knows, we might be in it again someday. So, check it out. The Broadcast Tools Pro Mix 4. And where do you get it? We get it from Broadcasters General Store at bgs.cc. Or, you know, they just work so well on the phone. They're just, they're set up for that. Friendly voices and great service at 352-622-7700. 352-622-7700. Check them out. Thanks to Broadcaster General Store and Broadcast Tools for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Encourage you to patronize them. Check them out if you would. Um, all right. Bill Harlan is with us from ERI. And Bill, we should get right back into uh, into the pictures and videos. But you know what? Before we get to the Empire State Building pictures, I'm wondering if uh, if Suncast can uh, change gears quickly and get that video ready. Uh, Bill, you haven't seen this, I don't think, but I've got about one minute of video here that was a, uh, a drone climb up a tower that shows several ERI antennas, different ones, and maybe you can tell us about that. Suncast uh, says he's ready, so let's see it. Uh, let's see, right there. Those are not ERI antennas right there. They must be coming up next. Do, 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 do. I think that's a backup antenna for somebody. This is actually, a, about a... Yeah, Bill? Actually, I think those are 100A. That's a 4-bay 100A. Oh. And then this is... Uh, now, there's a 4-bay with radomes. Yeah, that's 4-bay SHPX. That one had, particular one had white radomes. And then here and is a big antenna. One, two, three, four, five... Six bays, it's 12 bays. It's 12 bay antenna. 12 bay center side. bed rotor tower. Yep. Then here's a one bay. And a single That's my bay LPX. The, and now I'm going to see if Suncast can stop this video at the at the end before it fades to black. But this is an eight bay uh, yeah. SPHX, I suppose. Yep. Uh, right right there. Black radomes. And there you can see just sticking up above there is That's the shorting stub. Uh, that's a quarter wave shorting stub that uh, grounds the inner to the outer. So uh, it. Oh, uh, that's just above the, the highest the bay there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and and then the the lightning dissipators. What do you call those? What what's your branding on those? Uh, we just call them lightning spurs. Oh, lightning spurs. Okay, lightning spurs. Yeah. And this tower, I'll tell you, is on the south side of Nashville. It's it's actually just barely into uh, Williamson County in in Brentwood, Tennessee. Uh, you're looking mm -hmm. pretty much to the south in this drone shot. The sun is setting over to the right in, in the west, and you're looking out over uh, the um, the Brentwood, Tennessee area. But there's a bunch of um, Nashville FMs on on this tower. Uh, so I just I think it's a beautiful, beautiful tower. So yeah. All right, uh, Suncast. We got some pictures ready. Uh, the the next ones in the series, and and Bill's going to tell us about these. Oh my goodness, what are we looking at, Bill? Oh, this is uh, the auxiliary antenna for the Empire State Building. It's a three bay. And uh, uh, what's uh, probably the coolest thing about this is uh, we all hear about uh, full wave and half waves bay to bay spacing. Uh, mm -hmm. This particular antenna has what we call N minus one over N spacing. So it's three bays. What? Yes, okay. 0.66 wavelength. And the benefit of that is this is right above the dome on the Empire State Building. And uh, mm -hmm. the problem is uh, there were the problem with the Alfred antenna, which uh, is around the rings uh, on the dome, is that uh, they, you can't operate on it uh, and have the observation deck open. And oh. so the, the benefit of reducing from full wave spacing is when you get to N minus one over N, or 0.66 in the case of this three bay, uh, you massively 
reduce the amount of downward radiation. And so this antenna can have all 19 of the FM stations on the Empire State Building operating into this antenna at the same time, and you can still have the observation deck open. And uh, what's cow. going on? Yes. yes. And what's wow. going on here is, uh, as you notice, unlike uh, most of our panel antennas where we have a mesh screen reflector behind them, these are, it's a, a solid steel reflector. And that's because they're welded around the outside of the tower so that uh, climbers can crawl through the aperture with the antenna operating. And then this uh, ice shield above it is actually also designed as an RF shield. So everybody can be running, everybody can be running at full power, and you can come out of the tower after crawling through the inside of uh, the auxiliary FM antenna and come out on that ice shield and everybody can be running and you can just stand there on, uh, and it's still below uh, occupational uh, radiation levels. And uh, this is part of the, the acceptance testing was we measured that before we put the antenna in because obviously fixing it after you put it up is a lot more expensive. I believe Chris Tobin has been up there on, uh, on you know, on a, on a play date and swung from those. Chris, you, you've seen this antenna, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've seen the antenna, the original, the, the primary one also, the old Alfred antenna system. I've been up on that uh, the, the dome out on the catwalk on many occasions, yes. It is, um, it is a sight to behold. I mean, it's, it's a work of art, the antenna design and the latest installation. Uh, it's pretty wild. I mean, it's even more interesting if you, you know, if you like RF, the black magic of it. You read the history of the Alfred antenna, the elliptical pattern and the 45 degree angle that the little dipoles are at. Um, it's pretty cool. And the, the original Alfred, I think, started in Philadelphia, if memory serves me right. New York, I think, was second. But the best part was I didn't realize until years after working, while working in the building, up on the, in the observation deck 102, and you look through the portholes, or the windows now, they're, I think they're rectangular windows, and you look down, you could see the dipoles at an angle. I had no idea that RFR at the time the, the amount of RF that was happening in that room as a kid when I was going up there for observation purposes. Years <laughs> later to find out, oh, you replaced the glass with a certain type of uh, uh, RF uh, deficiency <laughs> built into it for a reason. Yeah. It was yeah. fascinating. And then, and then, you know, it's just like it became the broadband antenna uh, after the new master antenna went in, the ERI. So when that went on, the air, when that would go on, it was very limited because of its, you know, its inability to maintain RF away from the observation deck. I, I guess, uh, Bill, you said 19 stations can operate into that uh, standby antenna at the same time, or the aux antenna. Are those 19 stations using the same combining system as they are for the main, or is it a separate combining system? It's a separate combining system. It's a fully redundant auxiliary oh. system. Uh, and, wow. and And everyone, it, the, the system is rated for minus 10 dBc HD. And uh, we spent, uh, it's actually a very unusual feed system. Uh, the antenna is fed with, it has two inputs, uh, a right-hand CP input and a left-hand CP input. And there are actually two constant impedance combiners. Uh, one has 10 stations in it and the other has nine. And uh, they each feed a transmission line. So when all 19 are on, 10 have right-hand CP and nine have left-hand CP. Goodness gracious. And, and CP stands for circular polarization, right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, we have another picture of the same antenna, the Suncast. If you could toss that up, we'll take a look at, at this other picture that Bill's provided. Is this the same antenna? That's the same antenna. This is just before we put the ice shield on it to uh, measure that. This is uh, the uh, acceptance testing. Uh, that's on our the, the first turntable, and uh, that was the acceptance testing to uh, demonstrate the ASME pattern uh, complying with specifications. Now, if I'm looking closely at this, and maybe Suncast can zoom in a little bit more, I'm seeing on each cogwheel, if you will, each uh, each you know four prong thing there, I'm seeing two of them. There's like two cogwheels. What's the smaller one, and what's the larger one for there? Uh, the larger one's actually the radiating element, and the smaller one is uh, a, a parasitic dome, which actually improves bandwidth. Improves bandwidth. Okay. Wow. Wow. And you call this a three-bay antenna? Actually, there are 12 of those cogwheels, um, what, on, on four different sides, making up, uh, you know, it takes four of them to make one bay level, right? Right. And uh, when you have a six-foot, six-inch face like that, it, uh, four around gives very good pattern circularity. 
I can imagine. I can imagine. Wow, uh, man, and well, we are running out, running low on time. Bill, let's uh, let, let's take a look at the next uh, picture. And this is an antenna in an orientation that you typically don't see an antenna on this next picture. What are we looking at here? Uh, this is actually an eight bay axiom. The axiom uses rotot a rototeller uh, element, uh, but uh, it has a special feed system. So uh, this can cover 18 megahertz of the FM band. Uh, it was really intended to be a, uh, a lower cost master FM antenna. Uh, and uh, in fact, we just put a 16 bay version of this uh, up on West Tiger uh, 2 uh, to replace the uh, antenna that burned up a couple of years ago. Uh, the, these are half wave spaced elements. They're 60 inches apart and, uh, it uses a three stage feed system and, and the element orientation, the way they're fed and the way the feed system works is, is how we achieve the bandwidth. It looks like, um, the bays, well, not exactly alternates. Some ha look like they're different orientations of the, uh, the active part of, of the element there. Yes. Am it, I seeing that right? With because we're head, yeah. They're half wave spaced, so some of the elements are flipped uh, to keep okay. everything in place. Gotcha. Okay, but you the, you said the the secret to this or the the key to its being able to be broadbanded is this this what three level feed system? Uh, I'm not sure what you, you call it. Three level. Yes, you have a three level feed system, uh, and uh, basically you have four bay elements which are made up of two 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 end fed two bay pairs. Hmm. And uh, the, a pair of them are combined. Okay. Okay. Wow. That's uh, that is fascinating. <laughs> that took that took some math and some uh, calculation to make that work, didn't it? Yes. Uh, and uh, we've got it set up that way. That's basic. This is it's in final tuning, so that's why it's laying on its side. Speaking of tuning um, between bays, uh, if, if you you mentioned a number uh, to me that you said was kind of a magic number in terms of, of spacing, and that was 0.926. What's special about that number? Well, if you look at 0.9 or 0.926 spacing, actually the gain, the, the way we calculate gain is the gain itself is actually slightly higher than it is with full wave spacing. But the real benefit of it is you you maintain the same level of gain, but you substantially reduce the downward and upward radiation. And so uh, for those, yeah, for those who don't know, what is the benefit of reducing downward radiation? And we mean almost straight downward toward the transmitter building and straight upward radiation. What's the benefit of reducing that? Well, one, you get to put that energy where somebody might be able to hear it. But more importantly, if you're on the roof of a building or you're on, I'm from the Pacific Northwest. So my idea of a thousand foot tower is a 150 foot tower on top of a 850 foot mountain above your listening area. So when you have short towers or you're on a building rooftop, then downward radiation is a big deal. And that's that's a bit of a foreign idea to people in flat land like uh, like me. We have tall towers here, so downward radiation is not a human exposure problem. But hey, if you can put more power out to the people instead of down at the transmitter building, that that sounds like like a good idea. Um, Suncast, what is the what's the next uh, picture we've got here? Oh, that looks complicated. Oh, yeah, well, no, it's not not that complicated. That's. Um it's deceptive, but uh, that's a cogwheel antenna that's uh, on, on that uh, is uh, two Beasley stations in Tampa. Uh, that's on top of a 550 foot tower. Uh, the four bay rototiller, or the, it's actually a six bay half wave spaced rototiller, is an aux antenna. You see the mm -hmm. transition platform right right above that. Uh, yeah. This in this tower is uh, in a rather dense part of uh, in terms of buildings and commercial properties and residential in, in uh, Tampa. And so it's got very short guying. And so this uh, little 550 foot tower is actually face guide. So uh, it, uh, so you've got uh, those guy wires off, uh, not very far from, I think it's uh, 35 or 40% guide. Oh, wow. That is short guide. My goodness. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. Uh, and so we're, we're running short on time. Let's uh, see what's, what the next picture is we have, uh, in the, <clears throat> in, okay, this picture. All right. And this one, oh, what's this? Yeah, this is on Lookout Mountain. This is a directional, uh, uh, panel antenna owned by iHeart. 
Uh, and uh, that's actually in a little self-supporting tower that we manufacture to support that. Uh, it's directional because, the, of course, you're on Lookout Mountain. So on the backside, uh, there really isn't any population. And, of course, you got the quiet zone uh, uh, north Boulder that you have to uh, have to protect. So uh, I believe there's five or six uh, facilities that uh, share this antenna. So uh, if we could bu- buzz to our next picture, I just want to get a little bit of an explanation from you, Bill. I mentioned earlier in the show about if you understand a, a ring stub antenna, uh, it'll help you understand what's being uh, how transmission is uh, occurring. Uh, so maybe you could explain the parts of, of this and what's actually occurring. And I noticed that the, the feed point is back uh, back in the in the in the saddle, if you, if you will, back in the in the um, you know mounting part of, of this and, and yeah. not stuck out on the bay itself. How's this work? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, you've got a bell in there with that, uh, and there's an insulator on the end of it, and there's yeah. a strap that drives one half of uh, that ring stub, and essentially the 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 round part is the horizontally polarized component, and the little stub that sticks up uh, creates the vertical component. Uh, this is really uh, 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 an update of our uh, the cycloid antenna, which was ERI's first uh, a. Uh, uh, circularly polarized antenna. Uh, they are inexpensive. They're uh, generally shunt fed. So uh, you've got pretty narrow bandwidth. They're definitely a single channel antenna, but uh, ah, as mm-hmm. long as you kept the number of bays and in, in, in minimized, uh, they were very easy to tune and, and very inexpensive. Uh, we updated this uh, eight or nine years ago. Uh, we used to make it out of brass and copper. Uh, mm-hmm. Copper prices uh, got way out of hand a few years ago, as you'll remember. Uh, so we converted this to aluminum, and most of the most of them we uh, we ship overseas. Got you. And we have one more picture, and it's a it's a diagram. Uh, a lot of you know lower power stations would be using uh, would be using this. And maybe you could yeah. uh, tell me. And and there's there's other brands of antennas that look a lot like this. What's going on? How does this work? It's that this is a classic shunt fed externally driven uh, bent dipole. You've you've got two uh, uh, half wave dipoles that uh, the feed point is that insulator in the center and the two arms that mm-hmm. hook out to it, uh, hook to it. This is a 100A series antenna. Uh, they come to you if they're not directionalized. They come in a pizza box and the instructions tell you how to set the arms to frequency. So. Uh, if you're on a translator and you get kicked off your channel, you can retune this one to yourself. Wow. All right. Whew. Bill, um, I, I wish we had two hours. <laughs> this is fascinating. And I, I think we could probably talk all day because we've covered like this much of what ERI does. That's just amazing. Well, you need to come here and do a remote. I think that'd be a lot of fun. You know, uh, uh, you're not a very far drive for me. I think you're you're uh, under a three hour drive uh, for, oh, yeah. for me to get up there. Yeah. So that that how are you got how far are you guys from Evansville? Oh, we are. This is I call it the Chandler Boonville Evansville Metroplex. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's that's not not terribly far at, at all. Chris. Oh. Oh. Uh, okay. Bill. Uh, I'm I'm going to give you a little fair warning right now, and I'm sorry I didn't give you proper fair warning before. Oh no. no After. I'm- after our this is this is the sneaky thing we do to keep our viewers and listeners through the final uh, uh, break, and that is we're gonna have a tip of the week. And, and Bill, it can be whatever you want that's gonna be helpful for engineers in our audience to either maintain, select, what whatever. Uh, what would be helpful for them to walk away with information from Bill Harlan and, and ERI? It's our tip of the week. It'll be coming up next, uh, Chris. Before we break, in any final question for for Bill? Um, wow. Well, let's see. Yeah, the one question I have, which people always ask, and I've always, over the years, have heard this, is do you tune the antenna on frequency or slightly off for icing purposes in, like, northern parts of the country? In general, we will tune the antenna to be about 200 kilohertz high if it doesn't have radomes. If it does have radomes, we, we tune it right on channel. Okay, good, good. I had an experience with a consultant years ago about that. It was great. His name was Dean Sargent. I think that's right, right? RCA Labs. <laughs> and, and, you know, Chris, the upshot of that is if if uh, if your antenna ices up, then your stereo image just moves a little bit from left to right. That That's all it really does. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Bill. I'll, I'll explain Bill. The t- with, during the tip of the week. I'll explain why I asked the question. 
Okay. Bill is going to be back with a tip of the week in just a minute. And I, I got to get a prop here. Oh, my goodness. I, you know, on This Week in Radio Tech, uh, oftentimes Chris uses his. I've been in the office so much with COVID, but we've been talking about the Max Connect uh 4G LTE wireless modem that gives you prioritized data, priorities over everybody else. And look what came in the mail late last week. It's a different modem. Now, see, I've been I've been telling you that it doesn't depend on the brand. This is a cradle point, right? We've been using this for a while. This one is a pep wave, and it's got some a couple oh, interesting nice. uh, benefits and advantages. Chris, you should I believe you should be getting yours pretty soon too. Either that or, oh, no, or your I SIM got, cards. I got the SIM card for, for oh, the first okay. one, I guess. Okay. Well, I think they ship me this one so that I can write up a little piece on how to do a port forward because uh, this is being used with some uh, Telos Omnia gear uh, and somebody thought they had a problem with the port forwarding. They wanted me to write up a piece on, you know, step by step how to do a port forward in this. So I haven't written it yet, but I'll be doing that soon. But this is a Pepwave brand 4G LTE modem. It really is so much like this one. I'm sure the uh, the UI inside is different, but it's the same features that you get from Max Connect Wireless. Fixed IP address. I better cover that up. A fixed <laughs> fixed IP address. <laughs> and uh, uh, so you just turn this thing on, and it, this one also has two different SIM cards that you could use with it. But you turn it on, you get your fixed IP address, and you can uh, you know do a port forward if you need to. You can use any other means you know to get into your stuff if you, you know, a stun or turn server, uh, you know if you've got a, a a VoIP phone or something like that. But if you need to push audio to a transmitter site on an emergency basis, you can do it with this reliable service and reliable data because you're getting. Um, prioritized data, prioritized over everybody else. The best the cell tower will do, you get it. And Chris Tobin has experienced this numerous times uh, himself uh, with uh, with Sam doing some live remote broadcasts. We've done a number of broadcasts here on This Week in Radio Tech. And hey, the SBE has done a whole uh, national meeting at, at uh, in Las Vegas um, with using Max Connect Wireless. So check it out on the web. It's Max, spelled funny, maxconnectwireless.com. And I think they got Max Connect now. You can just go to Max Connect and drop the word wireless if you want to and get to the same place. Check it out uh, because hundreds, literally hundreds of radio stations are using these for live remotes, for access to transmitter sites that otherwise don't have data, and, uh, and for backup emergency STL. Thanks a lot, Max Connect Wireless, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. A real help to the broadcast engineers that are listening. All right, tip of the week here. We've got a, just about a minute. Bill, what do you want to leave our listeners with? The most important thing to do is once a year, have somebody climb your tower and make sure all the hardware is where it needs to be and all the pieces of your antenna are there. That will save you money. And I know from personal experience because I've had a couple of disasters on towers that didn't get climbed, uh, that disasters could have been averted. So good advice, Bill. Thank you very much. Chris Tobin, did you have a piece of advice for us too? Yeah, I would, when I was dovetail on what Bill talked about, you can visually inspect that you should definitely do that without a doubt. Oh, no, what I also would recommend, and I've done it myself quite often, actually once a year, is sweep the antenna system, sweep the RF system from the output of the transmitter all the way up and through whatever else you're going through, whether it's combiners and everything else. And uh, make sure, you know, you could use a VNA, a network analyzer, uh, check your return losses, look for any anomalies that might occur, make sure the specs still meet the same as they were when the antenna was installed. And if you have an ERI product, you most likely will see the same thing, because I can tell you from early on in my career, uh, Dean Sargent, the RCA labs guy who was hired by FMX Group, was doing some experiments with us at our station. Single bay ERI rototiller comes out to the site, looks up, he goes, ah, I know what you got. He puts some numbers on a piece of paper, does a nice sweep test, you know, group delay and everything else with the transmitter, sweeping everything, comes back to me and says, here are my numbers, give me the napkin I gave you. Sure enough, they were within a half a dB. He says, if you, know, if you need a product that works, just call Tom. He'll make sure the antenna will work every time. I don't even have to tell you how far off it is in frequency. That's why I asked about the question with the icing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. We, True story. It was like, this is when I was like, you know, just getting in and learning stuff about RF. This guy just walks up with this $40,000 HP and goes, okay, oh, I don't need this. I know what you got. You're fine. <laughs> no, it's good. you're not. It, it, it was the wildest event. It was great. But if there was a problem with some non-ERI element in the chain, then he would find it, right? Yes, yes yeah. absolutely. But I, I recommend, Bill's absolutely right, inspect your antenna. There is nothing that beats visual, visual inspection. End of story. Second, yeah. do the yeah. RF sweep. Look at it. You'd be surprised at things you discover. You didn't even realize a bullet may be having trouble. Or, you know, there's a few things that could happen that you may not see because the jacket may be covering it. 
And, and we've also learned that infrared inspection can be helpful too, but that's, you, you got to know what you're doing to, to do that effectively. We got to go. I wish we had more time. We got to go now. Bill Harlan, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute delight to have you here. Thank you. All right. Absolutely. I want to, I want to thank Chris Tobin for joining us as, as well. And I want to thank Suncast, our producer. Great job with all the graphics and the video. Thank you so much. And thanks also to Andrew Zarian, the uh, uh, founder of GFQ Network, where you'll find lots of other podcasts as well. We got to go. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye. <laughs>